Welcome everyone to this Turpentine Diary podcast. You can find my podcast and videos at my website, thomasparkerhudson.com, where you'll find other art-related materials such as tutorials, reviews, and my gallery. Today I want to talk about visiting museums and looking at art. I've always visited museums. I've always had a love for museums. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. When I was uh, young, it was a habit I picked up um, then, and it's continued to today. <clears throat> it's actually, I think, increased somewhat, even though uh, most of the museums that are uh, close to me, I've visited numerous times, and I could sketch the museum layout and probably describe every piece of work, more or less, they have. I've been thinking about a particular painting at the Cleveland Museum of Art for some time. I wanted to write about it or do a podcast about it. So the last time I went to the museum, I uh, specifically wanted to see this painting. My usual routine is to visit some of the galleries every visit, and there's a basket of others I uh, rotate, and I don't always visit. And the room with the uh, uh, this painting was one of those I sometimes visit. The artist is Sir Joshua Reynolds. And um, so I went to, uh, during my tour, I finally got to this, uh, the gallery there and the room was blocked off. Um, I've seen, but I've seen the painting uh, so many times that um, it really doesn't matter. But um, if, if this particular instance, I couldn't uh, see it. I could describe the painting blindfold. I've. <clears throat> I have a very good recollection uh, and memory for paintings and art. Maybe it's why I'm an artist, I don't know. But um, this ability uh, stands me in good stead usually, though sometimes it has um, gotten me into a uh, little bit of trouble. When I was uh, in art school, and uh, readers of my blog know that I was not a fan of art school, I took an art history course, and um, this particular course is one of the gimme courses, the, the course that uh, non-art majors could take to fulfill liberal um, art requirements. So it was uh, filled with people who were bored uh, with art, who wanted to, uh, who had no interest in it, and simply wanted a gimme grade. And uh, so our teacher. Um, gave us an assignment to visit the local muse museum. And uh, she gave us a list of paintings. We had to take, uh, pick one of those paintings and uh, write a, an essay about it. And uh, of course, I waited to the last moment. And um, the painting I uh, picked, um, I could describe, um, as I said, without in my mind's eye, I knew it intimately. I visited this museum uh, many, many, many times. And so I wrote the essay about this painting. It was a uh, 16th or 17th century Dutch painting. And um, a couple days later, one of my uh, printmaking instructors um, uh, came up to me and said, um, you know, the art history teacher was talking about your paper at lunch. And she said it was the best paper. Now, this isn't, uh, uh, you know, a high, necessarily <laughs> a brag considering that, uh, remember, the class is full of people who didn't care about art, so the bar was pretty low. But even so, yeah, I thought it was uh, nice for um, the, the printmaker to you know, take time out to tell me this, and so it made me feel pretty good. So imagine my uh, horror when I got my paper and I had an F, and uh, when I visited the professor after class and asked an explanation, she said that uh, by the time she had uh, issued the list of paintings that uh, were eligible to pick. The particular painting I had selected had been removed and sent to another museum for uh, a, an, an exhibition. So obviously I had not gone to the museum because the painting wasn't there. So I had failed at the basic point of the, of the exercise. And even though I tried to tell her that I went to the museum uh, all the time, I don't think she believed me. Uh, actually, even artists uh, or people who are in, uh, into art, when I tell them I visit the museums uh, right once a week, um, I might visit the same museum uh, every week, months and months uh, uh, at a time. They just don't believe it. Or they're like, well, what could you possibly um, 
need to go to the museum that frequently for? Of course, my answer is pretty simple. It's for sustenance. Um, I need it. All right, back to Sir Joshua. Reynolds' life straddled most of the 18th century. He was the first president of the uh, Royal Academy. He was a, a intimate friend, Dr. Johnson. In fact, Boswell uh, dedicated his life to Samuel Johnson to him. Uh, he uh, was he is heavily collected in the U.S. You'll find his paintings in Cleveland and most museums in the Midwest. Um, his reputation during his time as um, first president of the, the Royal Academy was, uh, was very high. And because of that, you'll see his paintings uh, a lot in the States. It's interesting to note that he despaired over the lost secrets of the old masters. And it might be surprising to some considering he lived um, 200 years ago. And a lot of us look back to those times as the time of the old masters. But clearly, in Sir Joshua's eyes, those uh, the, the old master times where they knew the magic of art was uh, in the mythic past. The reason this is noteworthy, and really the reason I'm doing this podcast, is because he spent most of his career experimenting with mediums and, and techniques, looking for the lost secrets of the masters. Now, this is a pretty common psych psychological profile for artists, and you'll still see it today. Artists are uh, intensely interested, many of them are, in, in these subjects, and I myself have spent quite a bit of time experimenting with this or that uh, medium and trying and, and researching the history of these things. So, so for me, Sir Joshua's career it has been a cautionary tale, and um, I'm going to explore what I mean by that in, uh, in this podcast. Before moving to the painting in the Cleveland Museum, that I want to talk about um, reproducing uh, one of Reynolds' more reproduced paintings, a uh, portrait of Lady Carolyn Howard. And the painting has a certain freshness. It reminds me somewhat of perhaps a Manet or a Renoir. Um, treatment is loose um, and colors are uh, restrained somewhat, but still uh, lively and full of life, and the young woman has a um, has a freshness. The painting seems just fresh. Now let's look at the portrait of Ladies Amabel and Mary Jim in York. First thing to say is that the reproduction is not poor. A lot of times uh, you look at a painting's a reproduction and it conveys little of the actual painting, and then uh, when you stand in front of the painting, uh, you, you get a completely different experience. Here, I would say the opposite is true. The standing in front of this painting, it's it's very off-putting. Um, the surface is gnarled with globs and corpuscles of thick brown goo. The um, the flesh tones which are gone pretty much, but the the uh, figures are entombed in uh, layers of paint. You can tell that the artist has labored mightily on, on this <clears throat> painting, calculating different effects and working uh, very hard to achieve some uh, ideal. The condition of this painting is um, typical of Reynolds, I would say. I've seen many of his paintings that look off and as here, clearly what we're seeing today is not what came out of his studio. Fugitive effects have disappeared uh, and leaving us with just the ghost of some something. When you visit a museum, you can see some paintings look fresh uh, as if they just come out of the artist studio, even though they might be centuries old. Other paintings like this look like nothing that an artist would actually uh, intend. The Cliff Museum has a Poussin painting uh, several of them actually that are in similar shape. They, they seem to be a echo of its original intention. And I think in Poussin's case um, might be the culprit there might be uh, somewhat uh, overworked like with the Reynolds, but probably fugitive materials, uh, which is quite common then as it is now. You buy something that you think is 
a certain type of uh, material and it turns out it's it's not that at all or it's a very inferior version of it same thing was happening in uh, in the past as well but the main takeaway here with this large painting uh, which magnifies the poor effects the painting is roughly five and a half by six and a half feet and one has to just try to guess what the artist intended he clearly didn't intend for these uh, children to have ghostly chalky bloodless flesh and the summer background to be a brown morass of indistinguishable details that today look sort of ominous and eerie. It's astonishing how lifeless this painting looks, how stilted and um, bizarre uh, this painting of two young women appear. And what's actually um, really heartbreaking to me is clearly Sir Joshua spent a lot of time on this painting. You, 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 you just don't get so many layers and transient effects um, without a lot of work. So it's horribly overworked and whatever calculations uh, he made um, I have, I have just been lost the ravages of time. I don't think the culprit here uh, is poor materials as it is with the scene. I think probably Sir Joshua spent a lot of time on this painting and probably tried different things uh, experimenting some things didn't work well um, and it was impossible to judge how this painting would look down the road and so I think it's uh, sort of he deliberately tried these things and you can see the effect now this painting is earlier in his career compared to the one I showed earlier and I think as time went on, he probably worked through some of these um, issues and abandoned um, some of these experiments or at least uh, uh, alighted on things that work for him. Unfortunately, many examples that I'm familiar with are in this condition. Um, whatever life has been entombed and lost through fugitive effects and bizarre combinations of things that have been lost in time. So, Sir so Joshua could have been the model for Balzac's great novella, The Unknown Masterpiece. In the Unknown Masterpiece, the artist is carried away by the perfection of his imagination and his vision, and he works and he works and he works um, on a painting, and, and then he'll scrape it off because nothing approaches the perfection of his mind's eye and in the, in the novella, uh, the great artist who is uh, creating this masterpiece is uh, people are in, in anticipating what they're going to see. And a, a, a young artist uh, uh, finds his way into the master studio where he can gaze upon the, the painting in progress. And he sees just a, a scribbled mess with a, an ankle and a foot at the bottom and painted exquisitely. but. The whole piece is uh, uh, another, another, another nothingness. And to the master, he's beaming with pride of achievement and accomplishment. I think uh, that sums up Sir Joshua on some of these paintings, like the one we're talking about today. And <clears throat> to wrap up, one of my favorite authors um, is Balzac. Um, and one of my favorite artists uh, is Rodin. And um, Cleveland has um, several Rodins, including uh, a bust, uh, a study for Rodin's monument to Balzac. Uh, Rodin was commissioned to do this monument, uh, the great, uh, art, uh, great writer. And um, it was rejected by the uh, people who commissioned the work. So somehow that seems fitting, a fitting way to uh, end this podcast. Thanks everyone for listening. I'll catch you next time on Turpentine Diaries.